So a big God does big things, but a little God doesn't do anything. Okay, a big God does big things, but a little God, quote unquote, doesn't do anything. Right? And part of the reason that's significant for us as people of faith is that if we misunderstand the nature of God, who God is, we're also going to mess up our understanding about the kinds of things God does, and therefore in our lives we will be deprived of some very specific things. We will have less comfort, we will have less confidence, and we will have less courage. Okay, So we want to explore, do you want more confidence, comfort, and courage to navigate these storms and difficulties of life in and through even hardship and even evil, because I do. Well, this has to do with our understanding of God as a sovereign, powerful, big God that he is, okay? So to explore this idea, we're going to go right into the story of Genesis, and I'm going to give some background before we get to some of the specific texts I'll be looking at. So the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, and it's really in many ways a book of beginnings, right, as, as evidenced by, you know, what the name tells us, right? And so I want to put it in context. We're going to look at the story of Joseph and how significant the story of Joseph is in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, okay? How much, even just by how much space it occupies, all these details in the story. So, okay, creation, creation, you know, creation, the world chapters one and two, a sin, sin entering the world and just, you know, messing everything up and, and sin and this, you know, all this evil in the world, you know, one chapter. The story of Joseph, the narrative takes up 14 chapters at the end of the book of Genesis. And there's so many things, so many layers going on. So just to help us set the scene a little bit, here's a bit of a description about Joseph and some of the significant things and the changes and evolutions we see in Joseph and the, what the story teaches us. Uh, in the words of Elie Wiesel, who is a, um, he's a Holocaust survivor, he's a Nobel uh, winner, and really insightful guy. This is what he says about this story. Joseph is the tale of a series of metamorphoses. First, a family metamorphosis. A child falls victim to his own prerogatives. A social one, a poor immigrant, becomes a huge success in his adopted country. A political one, a servant turns activist and changes the socioeconomic policy of the land. A philosophical or artistic one. The slave turns into a prince and finally a purely Jewish metamorphosis. A young refugee without friends or connections builds himself an astounding political career, culminating with his ascension to the post of chief royal advisor. It's from his book, Messengers of God. Okay, so here's, here's a bit of a summary, okay? So we really need to kind of get a bit of the grand scope of the story. So I'm going to summarize some of the key elements and keep in mind that I'm condensing parts, okay? So really you need to go back more to his father, Jacob. Okay, so Jacob had uh, several different wives. Polygamy is something that happens in the Old Testament. It's never held up as an example. And quite often when it happens, things are so messed up. Uh, you, <laughs> it's just, it, it, you just see all the, all the trauma that happens because of that. So, okay, so his dad, Jacob wanted to marry this woman, uh, Rachel, but actually first marries her sister, has to work seven years, and marries her sister, Leah. Uh, he was kind of tricked into it. I told you this is a seriously messed up family. You think your own families are messed up in various ways? No, you haven't seen nothing yet. Okay, so he works seven more years for the right to marry her sister, Rachel. Okay, they finally marry, uh, but at first she can't have kids, and so here's what happens. So Leah, uh, his first wife, gives birth to six sons and a daughter, uh, then Rachel, uh, because she can't have children, she wants still to be able to raise children that, that come from her. And so she gives her servant, uh, Bilhah, to her husband to make love to her to have children. And so she has two sons. And then Leah, remember the first wife, well, she gives her husband, her servant, so that she can also have children. So, so Zilpah also has two children, two sons. After all of this, Rachel, his true love, gives birth to a son, Joseph, and that's the situation that he is born into, okay? So in chapter 37, verse 2, we learn that Joseph, who is now 17 years old, okay, so he's a young man, uh, he's speaking poorly of his brothers, and we also learn in the next verse that his dad favored Joseph, shows favoritism. Do you want to, do you want to like mess up things in a family? You start to show favoritism to one child, and this isn't even just something that's in Jacob's heart, we start to learn it because of his actions. And so what does the text tell us? He loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Verse 3, he was given an ornate robe to show he was favored. To show he was favored, okay? The King James Version translates this coat, this ornate coat that he's given him, as the coat of many colors. 
So this is where this comes from. It's hard to translate this word in Hebrew. Uh, we know it's an ornate robe, probably with long sleeves. But think of that. It's something visually that you can see that show he's the favored one. Here's the modern equivalent. Say there's a bunch of kids in a family. And out of the nowhere, everyone suspects that this one is the favorite one, but all of a sudden this one, it's not Easter, it's not a birthday, it's not Christmas, it's not graduation. One child is given a Beamer. Here's a BMW. It's got the heated seats, it's got all the trinkets, there you go. How do you think that's going to go? Not very well. Okay, so guess what? In the next verse, we're told that his brothers hate him. Not only that, in verses 5 to 11 in chapter 37, Joseph has a series of dreams, which he goes and tells to his family and his brothers, that they will one day bow down to him. And he's the youngest, like, you're not helping yourself here. Verse 11, the brothers are jealous of him, and in fact, they hate him. Okay, so here's how the story evolves. One day, his brothers are out in a field, and they're grazing their brother's flocks, right? And Joseph is sent to check on them, and they plot to kill him. So they're jealous. They hate him. This is going to turn to violence. They plot to kill him, and they want to throw him into a pit to die and pretend that a wild animal has eaten him. Great family. Great, lovable family story here, okay? So Reuben, who's one of the brothers, he doesn't want them to shed his blood like this, and so he's trying to convince them otherwise. But anyway, in some moment when he's not looking, one of the brothers, Judah, sees some traveling Midianites and says, let's sell the guy. We can at least get some money for him. And so these Midianites, also called Ishmaelites, are coming along, and they sell their flesh and blood brother for 20 shekels of silver. Think of that. Think of selling a human to strange, the, the amount of sin and violence and harm that that would do. That's what they decide to do. Reuben comes back, can't believe what has happened, and so they, they got to tell something to Jacob, and so they take this ornate robe, which is a sign of his favoritism. They dip it in goat's blood, and they take it back to their father. The father concludes, yeah, surely he, he must have been killed by wild animals. Remember, this is before DNA testing, right? And he is so incredibly sad. He refuses to be comforted and weeps. Meanwhile in Egypt, okay, Joseph, he's down in Egypt. He eventually finds himself as a servant of a person named Potiphar. And Potiphar is a high Egyptian official. By this time, the text tells us that Joseph is actually very successful. He's good at what he does, and he's handsome. But Potiphar's wife starts to like him, and she, and she wants to make love with him. And she, and she, and she asks him to do this, and, and Joseph actually turns her down. And this is what he says. He says, how then, and this is chapter 39, verse 9, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So from this, we learn that he is a devout person. He wants to honor God with his life and what he does, right? Because any sexual sin, any other sin, regardless of, of what happens to other people, it's first and foremost an offense against God. Joseph knows this. Well, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't sit very well with her. She's used to getting her way. She tells her husband Potiphar, he believes there that she actually did try to attack her, even though Joseph did not. He goes into a prison. While he's in prison, we learn that he has the ability to interpret dreams. God has given him that ability. Eventually, and I'm here I'm condensing, eventually he helps the most powerful man in the land, Pharaoh himself, interpret some dreams that have been causing him consternation. Someone remembers, oh, there's this guy in the prison who is able to interpret dreams. His name is Joseph, and he comes up, interprets the dreams, and through them, he's able to tell Pharaoh, hey, we're going to have seven years of abundance in the land. There's going to be crops. It's going to be good. But they're going to be followed by seven years of, of hardship and famine. So we better get ready for that. And Pharaoh is so happy that Joseph has given him this incredible good wisdom that literally overnight, he jumps up 50 notches on the social ladder and becomes the second most powerful man in the land, basically essential, essentially like a prime minister. Today, it'd be like someone who is the bottom rung of social society and becomes you know, the, the minister of finance in the federal government overnight. It's just this huge, huge jump. And so Joseph is, is in charge of all the food because of his wisdom and what he has done for Pharaoh, and he earns dignity and respect. Okay, so here's where Joseph's family comes back into play, way back with Jacob and the brothers, back in the land of Canaan. The famine has hit, and it's become so severe that they also run out of food. And so they hear there's some food in Egypt, and so they go down. What will they find? Well, they come to the person who's administering the food program, who is Joseph, their brother, except they don't recognize him. Many years have passed by this point. Also, probably Joseph is dressed in, you know, the fancy clothes of a high Egyptian official, which he is. But he recognizes them. And in fact, he accuses them of being spies. You are a spy. They've told him the story about Jacob and they're from Canaan. They, they told him the stuff. And he said, wait a second, you're spies. 
Now, in the course of things, he's found that their youngest brother, Benjamin, is still back with their brother, Jacob. He's like, if you're not spies, go back, bring Benjamin back here to prove that your story is right and that you're not spies, and then we'll talk. Okay, so then they all go back to Canaan again. They tell the whole thing to their father. And their father's like, he already thinks he's lost one child in Joseph, who he thinks was devoured by wild animals. He already thinks that's already happened. And now it's like, you want to take Benjamin down? But what are they going to do? Like, they're, they're hungry. And so they all go down to see him a second time. And Joseph, when they get there, Joseph creates this great feast for them. It's wonderful. But when Joseph sees his brother Benjamin there, he's just overcome. And he leaves the room. He's so emotional. He can't contain himself has this moment, collects himself, goes back in the room. They have the feast. The next day, they're all loaded up with the food. Things are good. Remember, I'm condensing here. They got their, they got their food up in the sacks here. But, but Joseph has this plan. He goes to one of his officials and says, I, w- I want you to do something. I want you to take this silver cup. And I want you to put it in the sack of Benjamin. Benjamin's the youngest, right? Put it in the sack. Don't tell them, right? And after they go, then come upon them, right up behind them, and say that, you know, this cup is missing, right? And see what happens. So anyway, that's what happens. The cup goes in the sack. They're off on their way. And the servant comes up behind them, take, explains what's going on. The silver cup is going on. They are so convinced of their innocence because as far as they know, they haven't done anything wrong. They say, listen, if you find the cup in anyone's bag, that person can be put to death and the rest of us will be slaves. So convinced are they of their own innocence. They don't know that Joseph has done this. And so this search ensues. And of course, they find the silver cup. Lo and behold, and it's in Benjamin's sack. Oh no, remember that way back in Canaan, Jacob said that if anything happens to Benjamin, he will die of sadness. And so literally they tear their clothes. They can't believe what's going on. They go back to Joseph in Egypt yet again. They go back and they explain what's going on. And Joseph says, okay, you don't need to die. And the rest of you don't need to be slaves. Uh, you can be free. However, this one, I'll, I'll keep this one. I'll keep Benjamin to be my servant. And of course, they know this. They, they, they just can't imagine this, this pain coming to their father Jacob again. He's already lost one son. And so one of the brothers, Judah, says, no, 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 no. He explains the whole thing. He explains how this is going to be heartbreaking to their father. And he says, I will go in his place. Keep, keep me. You can, you can keep me here as long as you let him go. And of course, the thing that's significant about that is the person who originally had the idea to sell Joseph in the first place was Judah, and Judah is the one now offering to go in the place of his brother Benjamin. And so perhaps because of this, perhaps he sees this change of heart. He can no longer contain himself. So we're going to pick that text up at Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 to 8. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Then Joseph could not control himself, but for all those who stood by him, he cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Yeah, no kidding. Dismayed at his presence. They've done this. They've sold their brother into slavery in Egypt many years ago. And now they are standing before the most powerful figure on earth that they've ever personally talked to, the prime minister of Egypt. And they just learned that that person who they had done this violence to is their brother. Verse 4. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. Maybe they're scared. Maybe they're afraid they'll get chopped down. Come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. What? They're the ones who came up with the plan and and who saw the traitors and were going to put them in a pit and then sold him to strangers. God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to prepare for you a remnant on earth like a remaining group of people on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Wow, so this is a very dramatic scene. There's all this stuff that ensues. They eventually go back to Canaan. They get Jacob. He can't believe what's going on. He comes down. There's this big family reunion, but of course, Jacob is older, so he eventually dies. He eventually dies, and we pick up the scene 
in chapter 50. So turn a little bit, chapter 50, and we will continue at verses 15 and go to verse 20. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, okay, he's died, right? They said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Okay, why? Well, maybe they think maybe he was just kind before because they wanted, he wanted to be respectful to his father. But now that he's gone, maybe his true feelings are going to come out. Maybe that's what they're thinking. So they sent a message to Joseph. Sent a message. Don't even go there themselves. Saying, your father gave this command before he died. So are they making this up? Or is it a real command that the father gave? The text doesn't tell us. Say to Joseph, forgive them the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Like they're trying to appeal to his sense of mercy. They're saying, we're, we're actually servants of God, so you shouldn't, shouldn't harm us. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of, God, of the God of your father. Joseph wept and they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. Interesting. When they had gone down to Egypt, they bowed down before him. And now they also bowed down before him, fulfilling that dream he had as a 17-year-old young man. Interesting, so it comes true. But Joseph said to them, do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring, about, bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Okay, so I'm going to underline that key line there. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Okay, so this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, be, Thanks to be to God. Okay, so that verse kind of reminds us of Romans 8.28, doesn't it? And we know that in all things, as the Apostle Paul writing in the 50s to the church in Rome, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Keep this in mind here. You meant evil for me. All those things, but God meant it for good. I'd just like to just, just recall a few of the sins and evils that are evidenced in this story. The sin of favoritism, the sin of hate, the sin of jealousy, the sin of deception, the sin of betrayal, the sin of violence, false imprisonment. Evil happened to him, but God meant it for good. And this is what I'm really driving at here. It's this. It's that our God brings good out of evil. Our God, the God that we worship or claim to worship, brings good out of evil. There's a church father named Ignatius, and this is what he says. This saying has been passed down, and I love it. God uses crooked sticks to draw straight lines. God uses crooked sticks to draw straight lines. Things that are messed up and broken, even the presence, presence of evil to accomplish his creative and artistic purposes in the world. And so, of course, I'm not applying this not only to Joseph, but to our lives as well. God brings good out of the evil of our lives. Let's get personal. Think of our lives. And maybe as you think this, this is, this is, a, thing, this is a big God who does this, not some little oh God. This is a big, sovereign, almighty God who has the power and ability to do these things, okay? And maybe you're thinking, okay, you know what? Maybe I've had some difficult things in my life. Sure. But Joseph still had all that good stuff happen to him, right? Well, if, that's, if you're one of those people... I don't know if you are, but maybe you are. I'm going to put to you a higher case. Jesus. Jesus. Okay, I think we can see this evidence. In Je- there are actually a lot of similarities between the Joseph story and the Jesus narrative as we find it in the Bible, right? So, uh, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples of Jesus. Joseph betrayed by his brothers. Jesus betrayed by his brothers. Joseph sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph goes through all this stuff to bring about the physical survival of many people through a famine. Jesus mocked, spat upon, tortured, crucified. He just takes on so much human evil upon himself, but God is even able to use this to bring about the redemption and salvation of everyone in human history who puts their faith and hope in in him, Jesus. Our God brings good out of evil. So here's what I want us to do. Three steps. Step one is think back to your own life. So this is something in your own past. Think of one thing that at the time was exceedingly horrible. Even evil. And now in retrospect, through the rear view mirror of your mind, your mental rear view mirror, and you know that this, you can say to yourself, looking back on that, yeah, God was at work in that. I'm not saying what happened was good. I'm not saying that. 
But you can say to yourself, in retrospect, as I look back on that, God was at work working through that horrible thing. That's step one. Step two, think of something in your life right now that is bad. Maybe even evil. Something in your life right now is bad, maybe even evil, and ask yourself if you think God is at work in even this. Is God at work? I'm not saying what you're going through is good. God at work even in this. Third, a question about honesty. Do you believe in Joseph's God? Do you believe in Joseph's God? Because friends, let me tell you this. There's a lot of people out there who think they believe in God, but they don't actually believe in God. And I think there's a lot of people sitting in churches in North America who think they believe in God, but they don't believe in God. They've created something that suits them. Some God high in the clouds who doesn't really care. This, it doesn't, this isn't his written word to us for all generations and, and just really wants people to flourish and be nice. And as long as you don't physically harm one another, I don't care, you know, whatever. It's not God. That's not the God of Joseph. It's not the God of Israel. It's not the God that Christ tells us about and reveals. Do you believe in Joseph's God, the God who is powerful, who is able to work good through evil, the God who is engaged in human history, not just some far off place doing nothing? So the title of this message is Good Out of Evil, but it was originally the most comforting doctrine. The most, because I think it is. To me, the sovereignty of God, the almightiness of God, to be able to work in and through all situations, even evil and difficulty, is comforting. A big God can do big things. A little God, quote unquote, can't do anything. When we believe in this God, we have a better understanding of the kinds of things God can do. Therefore, it's comforting. Why? Because God can work in and through the situations that we're in, regardless of how challenging they are. It's comforting. Two, it gives us confidence. Why? Because that God is with us, actually with us. Three, it gives us courage because we are walking boldly into a future where God, that God is already there. In a message called Sovereignty in the Midst of Suffering, Harold Kim tells a story about his friend. He had to bury his wife uh, from an illness when she was 40. And so Daniel Chong uh, said goodbye to his uh, lovely wife, Maria, and at the eulogy, he spoke at her eulogy, and he said that, you know, when people are, are younger, uh, late 30s, early 40s like us, quite often when they go to the hospital, uh, quite often those visits are for good things. Challenging, sure, but good, you know, checkups and the birth of a baby, those sorts of things. But for them, every trip to the hospital was a painful, stressful thing because she had uh, stage four uh, breast cancer. And, you know, sometimes it would be one step forward, then two steps back, and they were praying for a miracle, and just things just weren't progressing in the way that they wanted them to go or hoped that they would go. And Marie was getting more and more sick, and one day at home, after getting back from the hospital, she just collapsed into the arms of Daniel and said, Daniel, Daniel, I can't take this anymore. There's no way that God could love me to put me through this can't take it anymore. There's no way that God could love me to put me through this. And there is a few minutes of silence in reflecting back on it. Daniel says that he thinks that just the Holy Spirit of God just came with his comfort and his wisdom and his counsel and descended upon his wife at that moment. Because after a few moments of silence, she says, what? No, but that can't be true. Because Jesus died for me. That can't be true because Jesus died for me. Friends, that is powerful gospel truth rooted in an awareness of the love and sovereignty of God, able to work in and through even the most horrific of experiences. Joseph said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. My friends, the sovereignty of God is the most comforting doctrine, bringing good even out of evil. And so believe in Joseph's God and walk boldly with comfort, with confidence, and with courage. Amen.